Good morning. Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts. For as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good morning, friends. We begin another program year today, and today begins my seventh year as your priest. Six years have come and gone so quickly, unless you count COVID. That was a decade in exhaustion, no matter how long it actually took. But we made it, and we're thriving, thanks be to God. We have done so much in so little time. We've replaced air handlers in the organ. We've added stations to the cross, replaced slippery steps, and used them to put in a labyrinth for contemplation. We built a pavilion for 101 different reasons. Our fourth quarter ministry started and are restarting more fully this year. There's a lot of water that has gone under the bridge. We've had several staff changes, but every one of them has been a valued part of the team, no matter how long they were here with us. Thanks be to God. People are growing in Christ, and that's what it's all about. And so we begin again. Thankfully, God is a God of the retake. And through that, God makes all things new. This is our new theme for this year, and we will be exploring that. You will hear me say in a hundred ways this year that you need to be in a discipling something. Having a spiritual director, one-on-one, -on -one, a Sunday school class, a group or situation where you can grow and be held accountable for your growth. We will be exploring that in the days and weeks to come, especially on our Shrine Mont retreat. Know this. I'm thankful that God has brought me here, first as your priest in charge and then as your rector. And I look forward to where God will take us together in the years to come. We have been graced with a sabbatical grant that will enable me to refresh and be more equipped to serve here in the future. My first sermon here was on today's readings. And what I said then still holds true. I use it in any group session that I do. Last week's sermon on how things go when they go well. This week is where Jesus addresses when things fall apart. Jesus knows the importance of relationship and that there is no way we can be at peace with God when we are in opposition to each other. If we cannot be at peace with those who we see, then the unseen is even more impossible. So let's be clear about what Jesus instructs us to do when things fall apart. If you and a church member have a conflict, you go to them directly, quietly, respectfully, one-on-one. -on -one. This is so important. In our conflicts, especially in the here in the South, we have a tendency to use shame and leverage to shape someone's behavior. It can be direct or passive-aggressive. Jesus' way takes all that away. He's very clear. Take someone with you only if you cannot work it out alone. Now, I would say that Jesus doesn't want you hurt or abused. If it's damaging for you to go directly or to attempt it, then ask for help. What Jesus also is very clear about is not going behind the scenes and talking about the situation with one or 20 people to get advice. That is disrespectful to the person. They may have committed what in their minds was a faux pas more than a sin. You can figure it out together. If you scatter what they did around, then you are the one sinning. But what if that one-on-one -on -one doesn't work, or they keep on doing the thing, or maybe even think that you were wrong and they are right? 
then bring in one or two to confer with you both. In Jesus' day, you had to have that more than one witness to a sin or crime. If you remember the woman caught in adultery who was about to be stoned, for them to get to that point, several had to be in on the situation and had to have witnessed it. These one or two are there to hold confidence and maintain respect for both parties. We do not stack the deck with people from our side, but we seek those who will help us seek truth, then accountability, and then reconciliation. I've been one of those parties in many a situation. Leaders here at the church, couples who are going through a hard time, but finding a way, often a middle way, has been so important. Remember, reconciliation is more than saying sorry. It's more than making amends. It is to again be within eyelash distance of one another. Re, again, con, with, cilia, eyelash, or small hair. That's pretty close. That's what we're aiming for, an intimacy, again, that we have lost. To be close enough to smell the other one's breath. But what if the one-on-one or the trusted one or two doesn't work? Then we bring it to the church. Only then do we appeal to the body. And this is not through gossip or chit-chat. Now, had this happened, it would have been a very formal, prayerful, and solemn occasion. Friends, it's so important for us to be in good relations with one another. At the end of the day, we are all we've got. This summer, we've been inundated with pictures of disasters from across the whole world, many in places that normally don't have disasters. And over and over again, as people have lost everything, they repeatedly say, at least we have each other. And if the person in conflict with you does not listen to you, the trusted friends, or the church, then we are to treat them as someone not in the church. Jesus says, as a Gentile or a tax collector. So often this has been heard as exile or exclusion. I had a landlord in Texas whose church did this to her because she went to a dance. But how did Jesus treat people, Gentiles and tax collectors? He was respectful. He showed mercy. He extended grace. If we treat those who have wronged us the way Jesus treated Gentiles and tax collectors, then we are to love them. I used a phrase a few weeks ago, and I repeat it here. Instead of exclusion, some people are EGR, extra grace required. Instead of shaming or shunning, we find a way, if possible, to stay in relationship with them. This may or may not be possible. As I preached last week, St. Paul taught, If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Romans 12, 18. Sometimes, God help us, it just isn't possible. But we cannot declare that before we try. Now, Stephanie, my wife, and I have been dealing with a situation apart from anything or anyone here in the church. It's lasted for the last several months. It's one of those never-ending, absurd situations of modern life. It could be easy to point fingers, cast blame, or just raise up a cloud of curses that would never dissipate. Or I could recognize that Steph and I have done everything in our power to do to do things right and well. All our helpers and supportive agents have done everything in their power. And we will just have to wait for things to take their course. It's not easy, enjoyable, or sane even. But it is what it is. And that is when I have to lean on grace for myself, the situation, and everyone involved. And were it in my power to use it as an example so that it never happens to anyone else ever again. Now, thankfully, I could say that in God's grace it was wrapped up on Saturday. Thanks be to God. When Jesus shows us how important we truly are uh, with what he says next, what we do now echoes through eternity. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. So often when we hear this, we affix it to Peter and the keys to the kingdom. That's why the keys are the symbol of the Pope to this day. It was true for Peter, but it's also true for us. When we ask forgiveness for our sins and when we forgive others from their sins, we can be set free from the hard implications of them. Now, do they go away? No. Are there no ramifications? No. But we can find ways to ease the ripples across our common lake that sin causes. A professor in the seminary described sin this way. Sin's like a big rock that somebody throws in a lake. 
We have no way of knowing where the ripples will go. And once they start, we are powerless to stop them. But then Jesus steps in and his peace be still comes. And somehow, someway, while the rock is still at the bottom of the lake, those ripples are lessened and we all do better. When we come to the prayer of confession in our service, always remember that. Loose here on earth so that it can be loosed in heaven. Confess and receive pardon. What a gift, especially in conflict with fellow believers. Lastly, Jesus reminds us, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. When we gather, we gather in Jesus' name, in good times, but also in bad. Next time you have to have a hard situation, invite Jesus in, invoke Jesus to be present. Wow, think of what a difference that would make, especially when our blood is boiling and our ire is up. We could say something like this, especially when we're in conflict. Jesus, be in our midst. And as we struggle, calm us, reconcile us, and make us whole. I bet that fight or discussion would go very differently if we just did that. Friends, not a one of us wants to be in conflict, if we're healthy, that is. There's often an unhealthy person who likes the drama, a drama mama. They strike a match to see how big the fire can get. God forgive them and help them. But we are promised that conflict will happen. And we are promised that we can be loose from these bad situations. We're promised that Jesus is in our midst even then, especially then. When things fall apart, know that they can be put back together. And Jesus is there to help us do it. In our conflicts, yes, even in our conflicts, he can make all things new. Amen. God bless you today and have a wonderful week. See you soon. Bye-bye.